Welcome to The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Wednesday, May the 5th, 2021. On this edition of The Politocrat, should awards be stripped from the recipients who get them after it is revealed later on that they have been the focus of a criminal investigation or have in fact, had allegations made against them for rape or any other crime, kind of violent crime. That is much of the focus of this episode. Coming up next. Welcome back. So here we are on Wednesday. I hope your day has been a good one. And, you know, there's lots, of course, going on. Before I get to the main event of this episode, I want to uh, talk about just some of the news stories that have been floating around here. Um, But first, again, I want to urge those of you in the United States to sign up for health care, affordable health care, at least health care that is perhaps a lot less than what you may have paid in the past, or maybe you've never had healthcare before, please sign up for healthcare.gov. Health is such a precious commodity. Your health is super important. It is everything. If you don't have, if you don't have health, you don't have anything, do you? Because that means, well, please check up on your health and please sign up with healthcare.gov. If you do not have any health insurance at all, I would urge you to sign up today. So please do so. You've got till August the 15th, but I wouldn't wait until then. Those of you who have not signed up yet, who don't have health insurance, please do so now at healthcare.gov. Thank you. I also want to let you know that you can purchase all kinds of merchandise right now at the politocrat dot well put it this way <laughs> you can purchase merchandise all kinds right now at the politocrat daily podcast online store and the web address is the dash politocrat dot my shopify dot com there's a load of new things coming there's already been a few this week we got in uh some uh, james baldwin T-shirts that I think you really like, um, just check them out right now. Um, they're available for you to buy at this very moment in time. The dash politocrat dot myshopify dot com. There's a another really good T-shirt. This one contains one of the great quotes from the poet and author Ella Wheeler Wilcox, which I think you'll love. You know, it talks about protest. It's a quote that she. Um, I, I think it's just a really priceless thing. Um, and it's, you know, those who sin by silence when we should protest. I think it, I'm just being, I'm paraphrasing it, but pretty much close to this. Those who would sin by silence when we should protest, um, make cowards out of men. And uh, you know, I'm just roughly paraphrasing it, but it's true. I mean, we really can't stay silent is the point of, what Ella Wheeler Wilcox was saying, what what she was writing. And so this T-shirt, I think, is a must. Check it out and a lot, lot more at the-politocrat.myshopify.com right now. Thank you. Please support the Politocrat Daily Podcast online store. And thank you to those of you who already have done so. Yeah, there's a you know there's a lot going on, <laughs> as as uh, as I uh, have said, there is a lot going on, and um, there's just it's just remarkable, really. I mean, the kinds of things that are happening, and um, phew, goodness gracious me, um, there's news today, by the way, that uh, a new. Uh, new iteration, really, of the Moderna vaccine. So those of you who have been vaccinated with Moderna, I don't know if you uh, take this 
with great news or not, but there is apparently, according to The Guardian, a tweaked vaccine that has been dealing with attacking the variants that have been uh, permeating South Africa and Brazil. Um, And this is according to trials that have been done in the laboratories, um, according to Moderna. And the testing that they have done has shown that the Moderna vaccine, as tweaked, is successful against these variants. And I think that's a really good piece of news. And those of you who have already had your vaccinations through Moderna, perhaps, might be saying, oh, darn it, you know. <laughs> but um, you, you may, you may um, hey, you know, look, it's better to be vaccinated. The Moderna vaccine as present, according to the CDC and others, actually does the world of good or it does well against these variants anyway. It offers protection against them. So that is something that um, is important to know. Also, there is an additional vaccine that a German company is working on that is also showing to be very effective in general. Um, And that is apparently, according to the New York Times, hoping to be made available in the next month or so, sometime in June, if not later. So that's some other news on the vaccine front. And also on the vaccine front, President Biden's administration have strongly recommended lifting patents um, uh, vis-a-vis the uh, vaccinations uh, and these vaccines so that more people can get the vaccine shots. I think that's a really good idea. I think that's something that's really, it's, it's long overdue, isn't it? I mean, I think it's way past time that we've had this happen. I, I think that you have got to have something like this happen. Because what's the point of having a vaccine if you do not have the present ability to make that vaccine available to everybody? I mean, really, this should be, this is something that should be done. But you know, it's all the economics and the politics and people's greedy profit motive that, you know, is really, is really, uh, is very telling, isn't it? You know, it's very telling. So the Biden administration backs the waiver of, um, you know, IP protections for vaccines. And I think that's the least that the Biden administration could do. I'm glad that that is what's what's happened here. I think that there's something else um, to keep an eye on is that according to a survey, now look, you know, I'm not one for polls and surveys and whatnot, at least polls, but this particular survey says something that I um, don't have a particular surprise at. According to The Guardian, and they quote this survey, of people from 53 countries, they say, The Guardian summarizes, that nearly half of the respondents in a survey of people from 53 different countries are concerned that the U.S. is a threat to democracy in their country. That is a greater proportion of people than those concerned about any threat to their democracy from China or from Russia, Patrick Wintour reports. That's not surprising to me, by the way, that people in 53 countries think this way. If you polled Americans, they would probably say China or Russia. But if you poll people in 53 countries, and I don't know if one of those 53 was the United States, But if you pull people from more countries, I think, yeah, they would point to the United States. And there's good reasons for them to look at what the United States has done in foreign policy all around the world. Look what it's done. I mean, only recently or really we know knew this from four years ago, many of us, but I haven't really talked about it. There was a CIA operation to engineer and begin the war in Syria. It was revealed in 2017 in places like the New York Times and the Atlantic magazine at theatlantic.com that there was an operation called Operation Timber Sycamore 
And that operation, and you can go look this up yourselves and read the New York Times article or read the Atlantic on this. They, the CIA that is, instigated and were behind and started the war in Syria. That's been going on now for what, six, eight, nine, ten years, whatever the heck it is, however long it's been now. The CIA started that war, engineered it, began it, fomented it. And that's not a shock to me. Now, it may be shocking to you. But, I mean, when I first heard about this a few days ago, I was, wow. That was my response. But after I said, wow, within three minutes of that, I was like, no, nah, not surprising, really, is it now? <laughs> you know, Um you know, talk about a superpower, but some would call it a lot worse than that. While support for democracy was high among respondents, only 53% they said they currently believe their own countries are actually democratic. How about that? The biggest, thre- the biggest threats to democracy, according to respondents, were inequality and the power of big tech companies. Wow. Those are just two of them. I would say there's a lot more than just those two as, as the biggest threats. And the poll was commissioned by the Alliance of Democracies Foundation among 50,000 respondents in 53 countries, carried out over a three-month period from February through April of 2021. That is, uh, that's rather, rather, rather enlightening stuff. Uh, and I'm glad that, um, that that's been reported on. And uh, there's a detailed report about this too. Um, very, very interesting. And, you know, not surprising because, you know, the thing here now is that a lot of this, I think, is fueled by the previous, cl- you know, the clown, that, the, the very dangerous clown that we had, the fascist that we had in the White House, the racist and misogynist that we had in the White House for the previous four years before January 20th, 2021. That is why I think you're seeing a lot of this. But I think that that answer would a fifty three percent. I think um, that answer would stay the same for at least the last what hundred years of U.S. administrations. I mean, really? I mean, I think it would go back at least fifty years, maybe at least sixty years. So I'd say at least seventy years, really. I mean, who knows? I mean, if you really think about it, the last I'd say the last sixty years. I mean, ever since that speech from. The farewell speech from Dwight D. Eisenhower talking about the undue influence of the military industrial complex. I, I think it's been going since then, if not before, where those responses from those 53 countries probably would, would or rightly should be. Uh, our foreign policy um, here in the United States, it's my goodness me, it doesn't leave a lot of bouquets to be thrown at it, that's for sure. More like uh, bloody body parts and things, you know, uh, to be so blunt. But that's really where we are. I mean, my goodness me, and I'm not saying that for effect. It's the truth. So there we are. I mean, those are just a few things. Also, another story that I would like to draw your attention to, dear listener. And once again, thank you for your time on this Wednesday. There was, and I find this to be very interesting. Two Americans were found guilty. Two white male Americans were found guilty of murdering an Italian police officer almost two years ago now in Italy, July of 2019. And both of these white males were in their teens at the time. They had a fight with two plain clothed police officers in Rome. It was a drug deal. So these two white male uh, assailants, murderers, were in Rome, uh, at, you know, for a drug deal. So they were there to do drugs and, and buy drugs. Hello. And they were really buying them, unbeknownst to them, from two plain clothed undercover police officers. And the defense that these two uh, teenagers used, at least at the time they were teenagers, but now they you know they're probably 21 or so, or whatever it was, was that we thought these people were thugs. We didn't know they were police. And what happened is one of these uh, 
uh, males stabbed one of the cops to death. The cops, uh, the one who survived, um, insisted that no, we made it very clear to them. We identified who we are. We made it very clear to them who we were. We identified ourselves and da 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 da. And um, yeah, we definitely did that. And there's no doubt about it. And Deputy Brigadier Mario Cerciello Rega, 35 years of age, was the Italian police officer stabbed to death. And, um, you know, that's... There you go. You know, this is very sad news. Very sad. Seven-inch military-style knife. Repeatedly stabbing him. And the other uh, killer uh, briefly, apparently, according to the New York Times, briefly wrestled with the other officer, Officer Varial. And um, anyway, uh, you know, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the white male who stabbed the officer to death said he, he acted in self-defense and he believed that the cop was trying to choke him if a cop is trying to choke you would you be able to get a knife and stab that cop to death I mean not that I'm asking you to do that I'm just asking you to just think about that that just seems well anyway I shouldn't editorialize or but just that thought for a few minutes a few moments and the two cops, or you know, one of the cops, the one who survived, said, "No, we know, we know. That's not true. He wasn't choking anybody. We repeatedly made it clear to these two murderers that no, you know, the, we are police. We are carabinieri, military police in Italy. So they have both been in prison for the last almost two years in Rome." during this trial and during the verdict. So this trial's gone on for a long time. Obviously, look, the, you know, po- 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 I can't even talk. COVID protocols. I was saying COVID protocols. <laughs> COVID protocols uh, have kind of extended the trial and all. So that was the verdict uh, today. Mr. Elder and Mr. Oh, defendants, murderers, Elder, and uh, Natal Hydorf, it sounds very Norwegian, that name does, um, Norwegian or Swedish, has spent the last 21 months in prisons in Rome. So there you go. Both of them convicted of murder, found guilty, two Americans found guilty of murder, two white Americans found guilty of murder, of an Italian police officer, uh, Gabriel Natal Hydorf, um, murderer, and Finnegan Elder, murderer. Both of them um, were teenagers at the time. It was a 14-month trial held behind closed doors for the most part. Um, there you go. So that's that. That that was one piece of news that jumped out at me. Um, and the other piece of news that has jumped out at me um, is this piece of news that... Um, <sighs> This is this is something that, you know, <laughs> why am I not surprised by this? Well, two things. One, Derek Chauvin's attorney yesterday or day before uh, sought a new trial um, because of some of the things cited. Um, there was a juror who apparently attended Black Lives Matter protests before or after or both after the verdict and before it had a T-shirt on. Um, with Black Lives Matter on it. And so there's, you know, uh, Eric Nelson's looking to try to do something about that. Uh, you know, all of the... And I said that there was likely going to be this effort to do this. Um, you know, uh, you know, I, I knew that there was going to be this. And so people, I told people not to jump up and down and celebrate anything. Now, we don't know what the ruling is going to be yet. We're not, not sure yet of this but but um that's something you should keep your eye on keep your eye on this please keep your eye on on this case with Derek Chauvin murdering George Floyd as he did last year less than a year ago we're almost at the one year mark of that execution 
We're literally 20 days away from that day. I mean, one year ago almost. Isn't it something how time comes around and flies? So that's one thing. And the other thing is, is that there was a reveal in the news story, I forget the source, dear listener, that literally when they went back, the jury in the Derek Chauvin murder trial went back into the jury room They polled the jury, apparently, and 11 of the 12 voted to convict immediately. 11 of 12. Polling them right after the trial had ended and right before they began their deliberations. So it was almost a done deal. Literally, as soon as they went back into the jury room to start their deliberations, according to a news source. And I forget where I saw this. I should have made a note of it. So no wonder that they did not take too long to deliberate and find this uh, verdict the way they did. And correctly so. I mean, thankfully, much to my relief, um, there's no celebrating this because George Floyd should still be here. He's not, but he should be. Lastly, Here's a piece of news, too, that, that, that came up today. You remember Rayshard Brooks? And I talk about him every now and again. Rayshard Brooks, the young brother who was running from the police, uh, he had been mildly intoxicated. Not that that matters. It doesn't matter to me. Um, he was running from police. He had taken a stun gun from one of the two Atlanta police officers um, who had who he wrestled to the ground? He over. I mean, this is incredible. These cops. I mean, honestly, these are some weak ass police. And if they didn't have badges and guns, I, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. I mean, I'm not advocating people be violent against the police, and I'm not advocating certainly that police do that because the police ha- are have been violent so much more. Oh, I mean, in this country's history, come on. Police have been so much more violent than the people that they end up killing. Uh, it's just so disproportionate. And this violence and this force and all this militarization and let's have soldiers in, in, in down the street. And this is this is ridiculous. And it's like Tom Cotton last year, almost a year ago, in the New York Times edit- editorial page, send in the tanks. To America, send in the tanks. That's what he said, send in the tanks. And that was something that should never have been printed in the New York Times. And people decided to leave the Times, their heads rolled. But the point is, is that what I want to get to is in the New York Times, dated May the 5th. Here's the headline. Remember Rayshard Brooks, who ran away from the police, tried to fire a taser back at the police as he was running away from them? Because, of course... Just a few weeks before, George Floyd was handcuffed and was executed by Derek Chauvin. And once those cuffs got on Rayshard Brooks's wrists, he knew it was fight or flight. And he did a bit of both. And he ran away and Garrett Rolfe, one of the cops, shot and killed Rayshard Brooks, who was running away. And... Shot him three times in the back, killing him. And then his partner, Garrett Rolf's partner. These are two white male cops in Atlanta. So his 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 partner stood on Rayshard Brooks' shoulder, his right shoulder and, and arm, while Rayshard Brooks was lying dead on the ground. He was dying inside the you know, Wendy's, Wendy's restaurant parking lot driving area and there all these cameras caught it and you had people uh, at least seven or eight vehicles in the vicinity when this idiot this murdering cop Garrett Rolfe fired like he was wired up fired like it was gunfight at the OK Corral that the only one with a gun who was doing any kind of fighting was Garrett Rolfe and the taser was not effective and that was no excuse or any justification to murder someone who's running from you Obviously, Garrett Rolfe didn't hear about the U.S. Supreme Court case, Tennessee versus Garner. And you may remember, dear listen, last year, Garrett Rolfe was indicted and was stripped of his 
job at the Atlanta Police Department. Turns out, right, that despite the murder charges and the aggravated assault charges, Garrett Rolfe has now been reinstated to the police department. What do you know? Why are you not surprised? Richard Fawcett, F as in Frank, A-U-S-S-E-T. Today's New York Times, May 5th. Dateline Atlanta, Garrett Rolfe, the Atlanta police officer who was fired from his job after fatally shooting a black man, Richard Brooks, in a fast food parking lot, was reinstated on Wednesday by the city's civil service board, which found that Officer Rolfe's firing violated his due process rights. Officer Rolfe was terminated one day after the shooting, which came a few weeks after the police killing of another black man, George Floyd, in Minneapolis. So there you go. And then it goes on and on and on. So, Garrett Rolfe, reinstated, reinstated. And by the way, he's out on bail too. He has not been in prison, um, and I'm reading through here. doesn't seem like he's been in prison because he was out on bail. It's just... Shot him twice in the back. And by the way, um, one of the bullets, he shot him three times. One of the bullets, two of the bullets hit him in the back. One of the bullets, or at least, actually he shot more than twice. And bullets went into the car of a nearby uh, person who was waiting to get into the, it was in the driving line or in the parking lot. And the bullet was literally a few inches away from killing uh, one of, or both occupants in a vehicle. One of them was a child. I mean, a few inches up, like about another inch or two up from where that bullet actually hit. And he would have had two people dead. And by the way, Paul Howard was the Fulton County District Attorney who brought those charges. He has since, I guess his term was up. Or he lost the election or he was retiring. I think he, I don't even remember what the circumstances were. But you remember Paul Howard, the brother who had the press conferences really clinical about how he laid out these charges. And his successor back in January of this year, Fanny Willis, F-A-N-I, first name Willis, spelt the way that Bruce Willis's last name is spelled, um, wrote to the Attorney General Chris Carr of Georgia alleging Wow, alleging that Mr. Howard had engaged in misconduct, including using videos of the shooting in campaign commercials in violation of state bar association rules. Wow, so this actually, he actually had lost. He actually lost a campaign to Fannie Willis. And I don't know much about Fannie Willis, so you've got to excuse me. But I'm just saying to you that she... um, asked this case to be referred to a special prosecutor. Um, He has declined. Mr. Carr is the Attorney General of Georgia, Chris Carr. He declined to refer the case to a special prosecutor. The matter is currently before a local judge according to this article in the New York Times. Mr. LaRusso, who I guess is the attorney for um, Garrett Rolfe, says that uh, his client's very happy with the decision and da 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 So there you go. Those are some stories that I, I thought you might, you might, might, might want to uh, consider. Um, there are people very upset with this, of course. Um, Gerald Griggs, the VP, Vice President of the Atlanta Chapter of the NAACP, said he hoped that the city would appeal this its decision by the Civil Service Board and the prosecutors had been right to bring murder charges. Quote, Gerald Grigg says, he used, and this is Officer Rolf he's speaking about, used a lethal weapon to respond to non-lethal force. There definitely was probable cause for murder charges. So now there's there are demonstrations in Atlanta and around Atlanta City Hall. Um, an organizer for a group called Justice for Georgia, Britt Jones Chukura, said through a megaphone, it was a kick in the gut and a slap in the face. Yeah, and there you go. So, yeah, this guy got his job back. 
Why are we not surprised? Welcome back. Wait, wait just a second. I didn't read you the most important part of the story. Well, the other most important part of the story that I think is the most important part. Chastity Evans, Mr. Brooks' niece, the niece of Rayshard Brooks, said she was upset that Officer Rolf got his job back. She said she, this is from the same New York Times article I was reading to you before the break. She said she was frustrated with Miss Willis. Now, Miss Willis, Fanny Willis, is the new Fulton County District Attorney. She says she was frustrated with Miss Willis for not moving forward with the criminal case. So wait a minute. She's not planning to prosecute him? Wait a minute. Is that how I'm meant to read this? So this new Fulton County District Attorney is not moving forward with the criminal case? against Garrett Rolfe, who clearly murdered Rayshard Brooks? I mean, he killed him. Ran away. Rayshard Brooks is running away. Quote, at this point, it's like there's no court date set. There's no ending. In quote. Quote, he's still gone. His children are still without a dad and it's hard. This guy has his job back. (sighs) There was sufficient questioning of the appropriateness, Fannie Willis argued, of the Atlanta-based prosecutor's office to continue to handle the case. Now, why would the attorney general refuse to hand it to a special prosecutor? This is something I'm going to follow up on, for sure. And I will be conveying updates to you, dear listener. Thank you very much for listening. I had to get that part in at the end there to just add that, what you just heard from me, because that's a piece of uh, information you should be privy to in case you have not been following this case or were not aware or were not by any chance aware that this murderer, this killer, got his job back. It's just like Timothy Lohman, isn't it? Who absolutely assassinated, executed Tamir Rice, a 12-year-old boy in uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, back in whichever year it was now, I forget, 2017 or 16 or 18 or whenever, 2015, whenever it was. And That guy gets his job back, you know, a few months later. He doesn't get his job back. He just gets transferred to another precinct. That's the system at work that works very well for the people who murder us. And Timothy Lohman, who had all these complaints on his record before, gets a job somewhere else, not a precinct, down two two towns or two counties over. He's like Derek Chauvin, you know, 18, 19, 20 plus complaints against him in 18, 19 years on the force in Minneapolis. And everybody didn't. Nobody saw fit to get rid of him. Oh, no. No, one, no, we're not firing him. Let him keep doing what he's doing. He's our grade A executioner. Oh, yeah. In a pinch, you can get Derek Chauvin. If you need a black person murdered, that's what you do. You bring in the A team. Your A executioner. Derek Chauvin. And then all the hypocrisy afterwards when they convict him and the jury do. do and all the hypocrisy. Oh, yes. He's a bad apple. And you guys harbored this evil person. Your system is the thing that's the rottenest. He's a product he's a product of it. And don't sit there, you know, hand wringing when you all are part of the very reason why this guy was able to continue to shoot and kill people, to murder people, to murder George Floyd. And to keep staying on the force with all these complaints. I think all of you should be in a jail cell with him, for God's sakes. Prison cell with him. Despicable.
Welcome back. So do you think that people who win awards, and whether it's sports awards, whether it's entertainment awards, whatever the award, Nobel Prize, Nobel Peace Prize, Pulitzer Prize, whatever, but I want to really focus on the entertainment side of things, more like the Oscars or things like that. Do you think that people who win Oscars should, or any film awards should be retroactively stripped of those awards for conduct that comes out um, that it turns out happened before those awards were given out? I think one of the most obvious ones, or two of the most obvious ones, would be Woody Allen. Three of the most obvious ones, in fact, would be Woody Allen and Harvey Weinstein, who won Oscars for various films that he produced. And I'm telling you, in the cases of both of those pieces of garbage, I think that there are people in those organizations, in the Academy, who knew, who knew that both of these pieces of garbage engaged in behavior like this, violating women, violating kids. I I totally think that there are people in these organizations who knew about this. Totally think so. You can't tell me that people that prolific, that powerful, that popular, that public somehow were able to shield all of this kind of thing from people in the industry who knew them. And there are people, I don't care who they were, they're actors, whether they're whomever, who must have known about Harvey Weinstein and obviously the the actors who were being terrorized and violated by Harvey Weinstein knew. But I'm talking about the enablers and there were plenty of those, right? Same thing with Woody Allen. Surely people knew in that industry. I mean, Mia Mia Farrow is obviously part of that industry, but I'm not talking about her. I'm talking about other people. Must have known. Must have known. And I am, by the way, of the mind of having those Oscars stripped from both Woody Allen and Harvey Weinstein. And I know that Harvey Weinstein had his membership from the Academy stripped, but what about the Oscars themselves? What's your take on that, dear listener? Do you think that Harvey Weinstein should have his Oscars stripped from him? Do you think that Woody Allen should have his Oscars stripped from him? You know how I feel about it. I've told you the answer is yes, as far as I'm concerned. What's your answer to that? I ask that because... There is a situation in England that has happened over the last week or two with a venerable actor, and I say venerable because he's been meaning he's been around for a long time. Not that that's anything, but it's just background. It doesn't mean that I am sticking up for this person because I'm actually not. Noel Clark, a black actor, an actor, black man, who has been acting for, I guess, two decades, 20 years or so. Turns out, dear listener, that Noel Clark ended up being awarded a BAFTA special award from the British Academy of Film and Television Arts. I believe that's what BAFTA stands for. And that was right at the end of April. That that right before that well actually it was not at the end. Yeah, well it was it was uh Put it this way, it was very, very recently. It was last month. And this is actually nearly a month ago now, three weeks ago. Outstanding British Contribution to Cinema. That was the award that Noel Clark won. April the 10th, that was a Saturday. And the BAFTAs were taking place over that weekend on both Saturday and Sunday due to COVID protocols. Noel Clark is an actor and producer. And it turns out that two weeks later, just about no, nearly three weeks later, actually, in The Guardian, Sirin Kale and Lucy Osborne, Sirin spelled S-I-R-I-N, Kale spelled like the, veg- like the vegetable, 
um, the greens, right? Kale, K-A-L-E. Siren Kale and Lucy Osborne, and uh, that's Osborne without the U. And Lucy Osborne with Siren Kale, they did this article in The Guardian on Noel Clark, and the headline is Sexual Predator. Actor Noel Clark accused of groping, harassment, and bullying by 20 women. So 20 women have come out and said, no, this guy is no way. This guy is horrible and reprehensible. He's a scumbag. And he, he's verbally harassed me. He's a verbally abused me. He's sexually harassed me. He's a bullying, bullier. He's groping. This article details this. And, you know, Clark said in the statement, in a 20-year career, I've put inclusivity and diversity at the forefront of my work and never had a complaint made against me. Now, let me stop there. Just because a person has not had a complaint made against them, that does not mean that that person did not abuse someone. You do know that the vast majority of sexual assaults, or as I call them, violations of people, are not reported. You do know that, right? Most of them are not reported. The survivors do not report these. And there's lots of very good reasons why they don't. Because of the backlash, because of the misogyny, because of the patriarchy, because they're not taken seriously, because of the death threats they get, the isolation they get, they get their jobs taken from them, they lose their jobs, right? They don't get job reinstatements like Garrett Rolfe, who murdered someone, who murdered Rayshard Brooks. They get their jobs taken from them. And the person that they are complaining about get promoted. They get promotions. How charming is that? Oh, I think I'll, uh, you know, can you imagine? I'll violate someone and I'll get promoted. That's a, that's, isn't that, isn't that just marvelous? But that's what happens. No, it's not marvelous at all. It's evil. And it is a system at work. Working just fine for the predator and not so much for the survivor. And so that's why I said, well, I've never had a complaint made against me. So what? That doesn't mean that you didn't do something. It might mean that because you're a powerful man in British acting circles as an actor, no one would think about wanting to go up against you because you've got so much friggin power. 20 year career. Then he continues as Noel Clark, if anyone who has worked with me has ever felt uncomfortable or disrespected, I sincerely apologize. How's that for a sincere apology? Then he goes on to say, I vehemently deny any sexual misconduct or wrongdoing and intend to defend myself against these false allegations, end quote. Now, look, 29-page letter, his lawyers say he categorically categorically denies all the other allegations from all 20 women, in some cases questioning their credibility. They deny their client is a serial sexual predator. Now look, here's the issue here. Obviously the issue is, is this guy, 20 women, I don't think you're going to lie. And I stand default with women on this. That when you've got one woman or whether you've got 21 women or 51 women or 101 women, those are allegations you should take seriously. Those are allegations that should be investigated. And I believe the women. Now, look, that's in any case. I believe that Tara Reed, I believe Tara Reed, and I keep telling you, dear listener, that I think that Joe Biden raped Tara Reed. Okay? That's, that's, that's where I stand. And I certainly believe the women in any of these cases, whether it's Harvey Weinstein whether it's Bill Cosby, whether it's whomever, you know, whomever it is. I don't care if they're powerful and prominent. I don't care if they're the person down the street, right? I believe the women and there's no um, qualifiers there whatsoever, right? 
So, this article you really should read. Um, you really should. There's an incident, there's this, there's that, secret filming, allegedly, um, secret recorded video of an, of an audition with Johanna James, who is an actor in, in Brotherhood, which is a series, I believe. Um, naked audition. I mean, listen to this. Naked audition. James recalled Clark had talked her into auditioning for the role. She had been hesitant. She was only 23 and fresh out of drama school. But Clark persuaded her, explaining that the naked audition wouldn't be filmed. Turns out it was filmed. I was so upset, James recalls. Johanna James, that is. Nine years later, I still cry when I talk about it. Clark denies ever covertly filming naked auditions or sharing such footage with Powell. Now, Gina Powell is the Powell. Works for Clark as a producer for nearly three years between September 2014 and March 2017, producing Brotherhood, which is a, uh, I think it is a TV series. And those of you in the UK can tell me. Um, excuse me, that's a film. Sorry, my mistake. It's a film. Brotherhood is a movie in the UK. So, and yes, The Guardian makes a point that he's a prolific filmmaker and actor in the UK. Well, yeah, no, I said too, he's a venerable actor. So look, we shouldn't be exalting those things. We should be dealing with actions, not titles of people, especially men. I've said that before and I fall prey to it here when I said he's a venerable actor. Well, fuck that. He's a, he could be a rapist. He could well be a freaking groper. Well, he's not been accused of rape, but he's accused of invading the spaces of women, right? He's accused of groping. That's more than invading a space. That's violating a woman's physical body. That's violating her. You know, when you're groping somebody without their permission and you're doing that, that's a violation of their whole being. I'm sorry, that is. That's not, in fact, it's nothing to be sorry about. It's a fact. If someone comes up to you and grabs your backside... That's a violation of your being. You didn't authorize them to do that. They come up and they grab your backside or pinch it. And you're like, what the fuck is this? I don't care who you are. Someone comes up from behind you and does that. Or whether they don't, whether they're known to you and, they, and you see them and they do that. That's a violation of your person, right? Obviously. And it's not condoned. Not by me. But then there's this thing, you know, there, there, this is, uh, yeah, and there we go. You know, here's another person. Sin Selvite says Clark slapped her backside. I mean, July 23rd, 2015. Clark replied, well, you know, she thanked him for working with for working, uh, you know, for giving her the opportunity from an unstoppable account. Unstoppable, I guess, was one of these three films that he produced and whatever. Great meeting you, he said. Would love to work with you one day. A second email arrived. Also sent you some Snapchats. This is from Noel Clark. Have a look. This is a quote from an email that Sin Seltvite got from him. When Seltvite checks Snapchat. Clark had sent her a picture of a naked, erect penis. Ah, oh, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come the fuck on with this bullshit. What the fuck is it with these fucking men? Honestly, I, I, I'm telling you, what is it? God damn it. I, I'm telling you, this stuff really pisses me the hell off. But look, my anger is not the point here. And it doesn't help the situation. We have to, we have to end this garbage. 
Oh, oh, he denies that he slapped her backside. Oh, and he didn't recall sending her an unsolicited picture of his dick. Oh, you didn't recall that, did you? Wouldn't you remember if you sent a picture to someone of your dick? You wouldn't remember? You wouldn't? You'd, you'd have amnesia about this? Another woman accused him. A production assistant on Brotherhood. Oh, so, yeah, uh, there's a pattern here. There's women who are accusing you. And they're on your production. Where you've got power. Oh, uh, oh, well, what's that about, I wonder? Uh, power? A five-letter word. It's about power. P-O-W-E-R. And that is the toxic masculine thing that predominates here. Power. Which is why. I mean, th- this is... I, 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 you got... I, listen, there's a load more. There's a load more. And I'm telling you now, this is, this is getting me so angry... I am not even going to finish reading this article. Um, I know I keep talking about the newsletter, um, but I am going to put this up in the newsletter, I promise you. Um, And in a few short hours from now, uh, tonight, later tonight, 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 uh, Wednesday, May 5th, 2021, the newsletter will be out. This is going to be in the newsletter, this whole article. And just woman after woman after woman after woman all of them working with him, all in film, all in the industry. And it just gets, it's heinous. And I, I am just, anyway, uh, I can't because this just makes me so angry. And again, like I say, my anger will do nothing uh, for survivors. I can only say that I am in full solidarity with survivors, male, female, trans, Gay, straight, you know, if if this has happened to you, I am really sorry. I'm sorry that this has happened to you. And I'm sorry, there's no freaking way people are lying about this. This is a guy, in my view, and screw this innocent until proven guilty stuff. I get it. It's, it's, It's the kind of thing that the patriarchy does to protect these men, Right? And I get it. Yes, you want a trial. You want to. You can't just throw out there and go throw them in the gallows, right? Because that didn't work well for black men. What I'm saying is I think he's personally guilty and I think there should be a trial. Now, look, I don't know if any of the survivors wish to press charges or not, but this guy should be arrested if he ain't. And now BAFTA has uh, they call it cancelled the award, which means that's the equivalent of stripping the award away. That's the equivalent of uh, them revoking the award. That's what that is. So he had the revoke. BAFTA uh, revoked the award from from Noel Clark. I, I, I'm telling you, this guy, I don't care what he's done, right? In terms of, well, he was a... Great person in the community. Maybe he was. Maybe he was a freaking decent person. Maybe he did a lot of things. But listen, two things can be true at once. And I don't care what he's done to help communities. I don't care if he has. Benef- good, fa- good if he has benefited the black community or benefited other communities. But I'm sorry, this is not... Um, this does not... Listen... This here ain't cutting it. You don't do this to people. You have a responsibility as a person. You have a responsibility as a human being to act humanely and treat people with respect. 
You don't do this. You don't do this. I am, I'm livid. I mean, listen, this has been going on for centuries, man. It's not like, I, you know, this ain't the first time I, I've, I've had this kind of anger about these things, about this kind of thing. This is a system and the BAFTA gave him this award in the first place. BAFTA, you should be damn well ashamed of yourself. And, oh, you know, well, we didn't have the information. I'm going to play you a clip from a Sky News report from today, May 5th. Or technically, well, it aired May 5th. And, um, look, I'm going to calm down and I'll be right back. The Sky News reporter's name is Lucy Cotter, not Lucy Cotterill. My apologies. Whichever way you look at it, BAFTA have just dealt with this horrendously. And he has done arguably some very good work around diversity. He has um, been instrumental in turning it around in many ways. It counts for nothing. It cuts from nothing. I feel completely let down. They also say that they received no first-hand accounts and had the victims gone on the record to them, as they did with The Guardian, they would have suspended Noel's award immediately. They wanted first-hand accounts, they say. But the problem I have with that is not only are you not meriting the allegations when they first came to you directly through anonymous emails, you're now not meriting this letter that has come from people that you have worked with or dealt with previously at BAFTA. So what are they to make of your kind of reaction to them? For the first time since news about Clark and BAFTA broke, BAFTA has given an interview to clarify the timeline of events and defend its decision to proceed with the award. If we had had one fraction of, of the information that The Guardian had, we would never have given an award to, to Noel Clark. That is, that is obvious, but we didn't have that information. The first time we saw the actual allegations against him was when they were published by The Guardian newspaper. And as soon as we saw the allegations, we suspended the award. There will be a lot of people listening to this who will say you had heard allegations, even if they weren't first-hand. You were certainly aware that allegations were being made against him. We were aware that people had spoken out against Noel and had made assertions that he had not behaved correctly but they were very generalized and they were in the main totally anonymous we were never in the position of having a first-hand testimony from anyone about what he had done or when he'd done it we've been speaking to the head of the british urban film festival who has called for the chair of bafta uh, chris majunda to stand down to resign saying that the buck starts and stops with him um what's your response to that chris has worked uh all the way through, um, together with the board. It has been a a, a joint uh, decision-making process. It is really, uh, I think, not right to single people out. You stand by both Krish and Amanda Berry to stay in their positions? Absolutely, yeah. Whatever the ramifications for BAFTA itself, what is indisputable is that women were too frightened to come forward sooner leaving huge questions for the industry as a whole. Lucy Cotter, Sky News. That was part of Lucy Cotterill's report on Sky News on Wednesday um, surrounding Noel Clark and surrounding BAFTA. And you heard Dame Pippa Harris. Uh, one of the voices you heard there was of Dame Pippa Harris, who is... Um, in BAFTA, uh, one of the higher ups in BAFTA, one of the very high higher ups in BAFTA, um, who gave this award, and you heard her saying, "Well, you know, we didn't have this information at the time. We wouldn't have given this award to Noel Clark had we known at the time. We gave it on April tenth. 
Well, I, you know, that's open to question. Would you? Would you have? I don't know, because uh, award shows give a lot of awards out to rapists and scumbags like them. Roman Polanski was known for years. And he won a blooming Oscar for directing a movie called The Pianist. He won that Oscar for Best Director in 2003. And we were looking around, shaking our heads around here, around these here parts of the United States, around these here parts of the film world. All of us were looking around, going, what? Roman Polanski getting an Oscar? Oh, but it's his, his direction was so good. I'm sorry, that we've got to do something about this. And I don't know that there really is some debate. Ooh, the artist versus the art. No, I'm sorry. I don't think those debates are the ones that even be had here. This is about someone's behavior. This is about someone's conduct. This is about the way you deal with people as a human being. This is a criminal matter. Oh, Roman Polanski. Oh, he did such great films. I mean, would you watch a Roman Polanski film now? I mean, there's Rosemary's, Rosemary's Baby and Knife in the Water and this, that, and the other movie and The Pianist and all these movies. Would you watch those now? Would you watch them? Would you watch Woody Allen movies? Would you watch anything that Harvey Weinstein produced? Would you watch Noah Clark's films? Do you think Noah Clark should have was was it right, do you think, for BAFTA to strip that award from him? I say yes. Do you think and do you support the idea that any of these men or women who do this in the film world or any other place should have these awards stripped from them? Do you support that? If that information, whether that information comes out before or after, but in this case after, because BAFTA claims that they had no idea of this, even though they knew, as you may have heard in that report there from Lucy Cotterill, you may, even though they knew that there were people who said that there were complaints, but we didn't hear it firsthand from the women. Well, maybe the women were too afraid to come forward because this society and this world and this male-dominated and patriarchal culture condemns women for coming forward, attacks women for coming forward, kills women for coming forward, intimidates women, Strips them of their jobs for coming forward. Humiliates them all over again. Or as some women said in the documentary The Invisible War about rape in the U.S. military, rapes them a second time. I mean, there was one survivor who literally said in that documentary by Kirby Dick and Amy Zira, the same two who directed the Alan V. Farrow documentary, the survivor there in the military, she said, when the sergeant who raped her or whomever, the I think the lieutenant who raped her got promoted and she got ostracized, it was like a second rape. She said it was worse. I believe she said that. I remember I watched the documentary a few years ago, but, she, but so I don't remember exactly, but I can tell you, she said it was a second rape that happened to her. Do you think, dear listener, and it doesn't have to be in the entertainment industry, it could be in any day walk, every walk of life. Do you think that people who have been either alleged to have done these things or who have done them, do you think they should be stripped of their awards? Oh, I think they should be. And I think if they are alleged to have done this, they should not be even considered for the damn award. Certainly until these things have been adjudicated in courts, why, why did the, and here's my thing for BAFTA on Noel Clark, right? Did they do sufficient looking at this? Because if they know, as you heard there in that report, that they had, if they had actually heard complaints, whether it was firsthand or not, oh, but we, they didn't hear firsthand complaints. They, could you have done some digging at least and some due diligence? Before even giving this guy an award, could you have done that? Could you have done a little digging? 
I'm not saying you have to hire a full-time team of private dicks, private, excuse me, private detectives. But my goodness me, you've got apparatus at BAFTA. You can't, you don't have, you can't do due diligence. That should have been something, that should have raised an alarm bell for you at BAFTA. That somehow, oh, uh, there's some complaints here. And you could have done some due diligence on that to find out, well, there isn't enough here for us. Or, well, yeah, you know what? The fact that this is even coming up and it's, and it's 1, 2, 10, 20. And I, that shouldn't be the litmus test, the number, even if it's only one. And I should not say only, right? Because one is horrible enough. It's horrible. One is too many. So if you've heard one complaint, oh, but it wasn't direct. Well, I don't care. You should be thinking twice. If you are not going to do even some due diligence on the one complaint. I just think BAFTA has a lot to be ashamed of here. Yes, they revoked the award, but why did it have to come to that? Yeah, there is a truth that someone can be doing great things for their community and they may be great at what they do in front of the camera or behind it. But but, um, that does not ever get to supersede violence against women. Because violence against women, between those two things, has to be the thing that you look at and care about. Right? Right? Because there are women in those communities that you did good to. There are black women in those communities who suffer from violence that men have perpetrated against them. So what kind of friggin' example are you setting? And then what kind of example is an awards body setting? I think that Harvey Weinstein should have all his Oscars revoked. I think that Woody Allen should too. I think Polanski should too. He should never have received an Oscar for The Pianist. I don't care what kind of direction he did. There will be some that will say, oh no, we've got to separate these things. And that reflects the people in the Academy voting for him. I would have steered way the hell clear of Polanski. If I was a member of the Academy, I certainly wouldn't have voted for him. It just wouldn't have happened. Wouldn't have happened. I wouldn't, if I was in BAFTA, I would not have voted for Noel Clark. I don't care what he's done in the black community. I don't want someone in the community I belong to behaving like this. And I get it. There's a small percentage in every community. But my God, domestic violence is freaking widespread, man. It's not like it's 2%, right? This is this happens. This is awfully common. I don't want people who do this in the communities that I am a member of. I don't want them in. I don't. I don't want them in any community. I don't want people who do do these kinds of things to be able to keep doing them. I want them put on trial and a jury throw them behind bars. That's what I want. I don't want them getting BAFTA awards. I don't want them getting Oscars. I don't want them getting Grammys. Or anything else. I don't want them getting NAACP Image Awards. I don't want them getting People's Choice Awards or anything. People's Choice or No Choice. I don't want it. I want this whole thing to end. I want violence against women to end. I want it to end, end, end. I want us to start treating each other with humaneness and compassion and empathy and professionally. This is not the same as someone, I mean, come on now. Do men and women who work in Hollywood or in any film situation or any industry go out on dates? Sure they do. But this ain't that. This ain't that. I'm. This is nothing. This is nowhere near 
In fact, it's insult for me to even bring it up. There's no way. I mean, I told you last week or earlier this week about that Ohio Republican in Ohio's House of Representatives, the state legislator there, who'd been on the job for less than a year, had over and over and over again molested, harassed, groped interns. People who were 19 and 18 and 20. It doesn't matter what their age, but these girls, they're girls. And again, it doesn't matter what they age, but repeated patterns, including one where a 19-year-old intern says that this 38-year-old male, white male, raped her. And he has the temerity to write in a letter, well, I want you, my colleagues, I want to spare you any more difficulty. How arrogant, arrogant, arrogant is that? Huh? I want to spare my colleagues any further difficulty. So I decided to resign. And the system didn't get rid of me. They didn't fire me. I decided to resign. System would have kept me around. So that I could keep doing this. And you know. The system just kept giving me thumbs up. And they kept groping those girls. Oh but this one. Oh this one is a a bridge too far. I think I should resign now. I've had my fun. That's what he thinks fun is I'm sure. But it ain't fun. What any woman goes through what any person goes through when they are violated their lives are shattered their lives are shattered and they try to push forward and survive and they do survive but their lives aren't the same Trust is out the window. The things they were able to do. It's not the same. It's like you've killed them. You've killed a part of them. That's what that is. There's no defending any of this. I don't care about the fact that Noel Clark's in the industry. I don't care that he's black. I don't care any of that. This ain't about, oh, he's black, so I'm going to... No, 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 and no. And I think people who listen to me know me well by now. That if you're wrong, you're wrong. And as Malcolm X says... Wrong is wrong. No matter who does it. Thank you very much for listening to this edition of The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore.